Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Welcome to podcast number 32 on Hollow Earth Radio Seattle. I am Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, your host. Welcome to Fantasy Island. I am your host, Mr. Kringen. No, Mrs. Kringen. Ha ha ha. But no, I am a single person in terms of marriage, but I do have a boyfriend. So thank you for joining me tonight. I was going to talk about, or actually it's not nighttime, is it? It is the afternoon. It is podcast 32, May 25th, 2017. Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen. I wrote a poem at my latest creative writing session. Every Saturday, I get together with a few other creative people at a bookstore in Seattle, and we write. We do a spontaneous free write. Some of the people bring prompt books and use pages and quotes from those books and then write stories and poems and narratives based on the prompts. I have a tendency to just show up with my diary and just randomly free write my my spoken word kind of musical rhymey type circular spiral patterns. I think Kring actually means circular and spirals and circles. So here on Hollow Earth Radio Seattle, I'm going to read my latest poem. Understand at it man, at a van, at a van, buried in sand. Landing strand, landing strand, landing slurred speech, breached safety, checking doors too late, extra dose, backfired, counterintuitive, impurity, impunity, immunity, got a groove to me, get a groove to me, prove you're not rude to me. Protect us from pharma sometimes helps, sometimes harms. Sometimes harms. Sometimes harm. Treat addiction with more of a risk of addiction. Seems like a fictional way to help someone heal and find balance. Romanticizing the end. Lend me a hand. Spiral of denial. Find truth. Forgive. Love. Be here now. Choice in voice, beyond the vice, we all roll dice. Science, chemistry, experiment, fail to see, it's a mystery. How to fix the brain, chemistry. Work with nature, empathy for the predator, empathy for the predator, empathy for the predator, sympathy for the trailblazer, deviator. Stories of brain scan, physical tests, brain scan, spec scan, brain like the heart, a physical organ. Read it. Read the brain patterns. Read the heart rhythm beat pattern. Mental, physical connected. Stigma to mental health. All connected. Beyond duality. Us versus them. Medication versus nature. So that was a poem that I wrote partly inspired or triggered by the sad, tragic death of musician Chris Cornell, the lead singer of Soundgarden. Went to Volunteer Park recently to visit the shrine of the Black Sun, the song Black Hole Sun, Won't You Come and Wash Away the Rain. Black Hole Sun, Won't You Come wash away the rain black hole sun won't you come won't you come i don't really know all the words to that song i'm not a humongous uh, soundgarden fan but i appreciate soundgarden and i appreciate chris's cornell's artistic beautiful powerful voice and his powerful presence in the music world and i'm very saddened by his death And I got into a little bit of a debate with some people about medication. I'm not anti-medication. I'm just a little cautious. I myself take Wellbutrin for depression. And I do have some anxiety tendencies. I also take the, the herb called ashwagandha. And I also take magnesium at night to help me sleep. 
and I exercise and eat really healthy, but I know that medications really, really, really help some people. And in fact, I am, like I said, on Wellbutrin and Wellbutrin is helping me, although it is a little bit hard on the liver, but I don't drink alcohol and I don't smoke. So my liver's pretty healthy, but I feel sad for people who are battling addiction to drugs or alcohol, and then their doctor prescribes them a medication that's actually known to be addictive. And I feel like people should be careful to switch from one addiction to another, you know, from a legal addiction to a to an illegal addiction, you know, from an illegal drug addiction or alcohol addiction to a addiction to prescription medications that your doctor gives you. Um, I know some bad examples of this are Elvis Presley, who died from a drug overdose, um, as well as Michael Jackson and Prince, who were taking various medications that caused heart trouble. So that is very sad to me, and I don't know all the, the stories of how that actually happened, but I know that I myself am just am more cautious about things like that, and I wouldn't want a doctor to put me on a bunch of different medications. I just would want to be careful with that. So I feel sad about that, but I feel happy that medications and herbs and natural things help some people, and sometimes people are harmed by medications. So it just depends on the situation. Every person is different and unique. Every story is unique. I'm also listening to an audiobook called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. And the doctor is the psychiatrist that wrote it is talking about how when you go, when you have a heart problem, you go to the doctor and they scan and measure your heartbeat and they treat it like it's a physical, you know, your heart is physical, and then they figure out what's wrong with your heart or what's right with your heart. Basically, how healthy is your heart physically? And with your liver and your spleen and your kidneys and your eyes and your skin, all those different organs are tested on a physical level. And what's interesting is that in psychiatry for mental health, they don't generally scan your brain unless you have some really strange, you know, like seizures or they think you might have a tumor or if you have slurred speech or something really obviously neurologically wrong with you, then they will scan your brain. But if you have a lot of emotional challenges, if you're very moody or you can't sleep or you have anxiety or depression or you get really angry and lose your temper a lot, those are all psychological and emotional problems. And they generally don't scan your brain for those. And this doctor was, the psychiatrist was talking about how silly it is to not treat the brain just like the heart, the lungs, the kidney, the liver, the spleen, all the different organs. The brain is actually one of the most important organs of our body. And this guy actually does a, what, what he calls a spec scan and they test the brain. And I know that the autistic woman that I admire, Temple Grandin, she's actually shown her brain scan in her talks that she does. And you can actually see the difference in her brain from a typical brain to an autistic brain, such as Temple Grandin's. There's a certain part of her brain that's larger than the average brain. And then there's another part of her brain that is smaller or has less activity. And this psychiatrist is saying that Different people have more activity and less activity in different parts of their brain, and he prescribes a treatment plan to help them with their mental challenges and emotional challenges by addressing whatever he sees on the brain scan in addition to what they say about their lifestyle and their family relationships and all of their issues. And then he prescribes uh, physical treatment for them so there's biological, which addresses uh, nutrition, supplements, food, and medication. That's real physical stuff. And then there's psychological, which could address um, the more mental things that you do and how you think and what you do with your time in terms of meditation and your thinking habits and patterns and also exercise. And then there's the spiritual, which is your philosophy about life and your deep down strong gut feelings about the main purpose of your life and your deep beliefs about what it means to be alive and what you think your purpose is on this planet. 
And then the social, which is how you get along with your family and your friends and your coworkers and your job situation. So he, dress, he addresses all four of those after he scans their brain and then figures out, like, because he says some depressed people have low activity in one part and high activity in another part of their brain. And then another person that has a symptom of depression could have completely the opposite of the other depressed person. So basically, he would treat one person's depression very differently from how he would treat another person's depression. And I found that very fascinating. It almost makes me want to get a brain scan and see which parts of my brain are more active and which are less active. I know that I have a tendency to have racing thoughts and I per perhaps might be a little ADHD and at times I think I'm a little autistic. I talked about that in a previous uh, podcast about the artistic intuitiveness of my brain and how it overlaps with some of the traits of high functioning autistic people in terms of being gifted and talented in some ways and then having almost learning disabilities and deficits in other ways and getting sensory overload and being highly sensitive to taste touch smell uh, synesthesia seeing shapes when I hear music having strong associations with smell and emotions and different moods and the texture of things and, and being real sensitive to loud noise, etc. So everyone's brain is a little different and unique. So I'm kind of fascinated by, by that way of looking at mental health and psychiatry and the different ways that people can heal and take better care of their brain. This doctor also says that it's really good to cut way down on carbs I did for I cut wheat out of my diet and gluten and all bread and most carbs and most grains. I cut that out of my diet because I had a thyroid issue and now my thyroid is normal again and I lost a bunch of weight as well as I feel less moody. And so when the nutri nutritionists say not only can you help your your thyroid or your immune system if you change what you eat, if you eat basically healthy fat, if you eat more fat and less carbs and more high quality protein and good fat like avocado and olive oil and grass fed uh, organic pasture raised meats and eggs and things like that like healthy natural fats made by nature uh, then it can actually help your brain it, it has a calming effect on the body it's anti-inflammatory to eat good healthy fats a lot of people are very afraid of fat but fat actually has a very good effect on the body in terms of uh, it's easy on your pancreas. Your body doesn't secrete insulin when you eat good fats. And it calms the brain and calms the body and keeps your blood sugar pretty even. So I just wanted to say that about my nutrition has also helped my mental health along with my physical health. So I do agree with the psychiatrist based on my own life experience when I changed my diet to less carbs and more fat and more good protein, my mental health improved right along with my physical health. So mental and physical is very connected and the brain is very physical. People associate the brain with mental and emotional uh, states of being when also the brain is extremely physical. So I guess the whole body and mind is connected and related so I just wanted to share that. And I wanted to talk a little bit about maybe fear of success. I have a feeling of shame based on aspects of how I was raised. Certain people in my family were encouraging of my creativity, but these same people were also a little bit critical, especially of successful people. I had people around me as a child that were pointing out to me that certain successful people will, were egomaniacs or overrated or underrated. So basically there was a judgment about successful people being, oh, they're just good looking and they're not that talented or, oh, that person is really talented, but they're not very good looking, therefore they're not successful. You know, basically all of these theories about why somebody is or isn't successful and if they deserve success. I mean, lots of evaluation, but not directed directly at me, more directed at other successful people in the world. And so I grew up feeling like, 
oh, I don't want to be one of these narcissistic, egotistical power trippers who's too successful. So I have a fear of success right along with my fear of failure. I mean, nobody wants to fail. But if you also are afraid if you're successful, then other people will be jealous of you. Then that's a double whammy. So if you're not good at something, Basically, I guess the bottom line is there's an over-concern with how other people see you or think about you. I think the most important thing is to do what you love and do your best and not worry about how talented or untalented you are. You know, it's, it's true that if you're good looking and you're talented and you have a good attitude and you love what you're doing, you're probably going to be more successful than somebody who isn't talented or isn't particularly good looking. You know, people do judge each other based on how they look. And that's sad. But I do feel like the emphasis in terms of me for my own well-being, I need to remember to do what I love. And I do have certain artistic talents. But I think if I, if I worry too much about talent versus doing what I love, it kind of takes the fun out of it and makes me think about competition I remember in high school, I was on the tennis team and I'm left-handed and I'm a pretty good tennis player. My dad was a tennis teacher, so he taught me from a very young age how to play tennis. And I basically would win almost every match in high school. And I remember I almost lost once and I I started hyperventilating and I think I had a bit of a panic attack because I didn't want to lose the tennis match. I ended up winning that tennis match. But I remember looking at the face of the person who lost to me and they looked so upset and disappointed and like mad at themselves for losing. And I felt guilty. And I remember thinking, God, I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. Like if I lose the tennis match, I'm going to feel bad about myself. Like, oh, I'm such a loser. I failed. But then I won the tennis match and then I feel guilty for winning. So it's like either way, I'm not going to be happy. And that's sad. And I I still have some of that kind of like when I do well at something, I'm proud of myself and I want to say, look, everybody, I did, I did something really well. And sometimes I get people who cheer me on and go, that's great, Shannon. I'm inspired by you. And then sometimes people act like they're all competitive and jealous or they don't say anything. And then I wonder, oh, do they think I'm bragging? So it's really sad that, you know, if we're embarrassed because we did poorly at something, we're supposed to hide that. And then we also are supposed to not brag if we're too, if we're really good at something, we're not supposed to brag about it. And I think that's sad. And so somebody also asked me, since I do a lot of self portraits, I'm totally fine when I share self portraits with somebody else going, Oh, look, Shannon, I did this self portrait. Like, I think that's cool. And so someone said, maybe I should start a group of self empowerment Because I know that when you do a lot of self-portraits, some people think you're narcissistic and you're totally like into yourself to the point where you're not interested in other people. Actually, I might, I might actually be guilty of that to some extent of being way more interested in myself than I am in other people. That's true. Uh, I love plants and animals, but I, I am preoccupied with my own thing. But I think a lot of people are. But I also like it when other artists do self-portraits. And today, actually... I modeled at an art school and I noticed in the hallway, there was these really beautiful, I think they were self portraits because every single drawing was totally different and it was larger than life size. And people had really intense looks on their face and they were drawings in charcoal. And I think they were all self portraits. And I remember thinking, wow, these are powerful. They're very powerful because if you look at yourself in the mirror or take a photo of yourself and then draw it, people know their own face better than they know other people's faces. Like when I model for people, I notice they draw me. And a lot of times the drawings will look like a combination of me and that other person combined, as opposed to just look like looking like me, or just looking like the person who drew me. Drawings of me tend to look like me and that person made it and had a child and that, that's what that's what our child would look like probably so that's fascinating so people know their own faces i think that self portraits i could call them self portals and i've done hundreds of them on my flickr you can see self portraits tons of self portraits if you just go to shannonkringen.com there's like over 900 i think self portraits on my flickr feed 
And I'm fascinated by exploring different sides of my personality. And I feel like it's fun to be the photographer and the model. It's like I'm being the actor and the director, the photographer and the model, both. And I also do it because I'm more comfortable modeling for myself. When I model for other photographers, I'm sometimes not that comfortable and I'm not always that photogenic. But when I photograph myself, I'm way more photogenic because I'm more comfortable and relaxed and not afraid to do anything. Plus, I can see what I look like and kind of monitor it and figure out what the best angle is. If I tilt my head up or down or from side to side, I find the best lighting and the best angle and I'm not afraid to play around with my facial expressions. When I model for other photographers, only a few photographers that I've worked with, and I've worked with a lot of really talented photographers, but I have to say that only a handful of them have been able to capture amazing photos of me. And I think it's partly because I just wasn't very comfortable, or maybe me and that photographer didn't have tons of chemistry, something just didn't click. When I model for drawing and painting classes and sculpture classes, it's kind of a relief because I don't worry about what I look like. I mean, I take good care of my body and my myself, but I, I just uh, show up and I do my best. And then I let them draw, paint, and sculpt me. And I just don't worry so much about what I look like. I just do my best as a model and then they do their best as an artist trying to get my likeness or just get the proportions and look you know, like a real human or sometimes people when they draw me and paint me intentionally want to distort and abstract me and I love that actually I also love it when kids draw me you know when I'm when I model for kids and high school students I'm usually well I'm always clothed because they're not supposed to draw the nude figure but I show up like in a bodysuit or a costume uh, or just a v-neck shirt and then they do my portrait and I love when kids draw me when either teenagers or younger kids like as young as like six or seven when they draw me kids have such a cool way of drawing such a animated interesting you know childlike way of drawing and I love kids drawings a lot um, there's such neat shapes and textures and colors and they're not afraid to just kind of use whatever color they want and just draw whatever lines they want to draw and I like that. So it's been fascinating to model for artists over the last 25 years and I was thinking about self-portraits and I was thinking about my childhood and how as a child I actually a lot of times I was kind of shy socially and I felt left out and excluded and I didn't always know how to get along with other people in terms of feeling like part of the group because I was kind of a loner and an individual. And I remember even being in first grade thinking, I can't play this game. I don't want to be fake. I just want to be myself. But I know that I'm kind of weird. So how am I going to fit in? Because I don't really want to fit in. I just want to be myself. And what strikes me about people is that I, I like what makes people unique. When people paint me and draw me and I go around the room and look at the drawings of me or the paintings, I love how unique each one is. Like people use different colors, different textures, different ways of marking the page that each person has their own style. Plus they're seeing me from a different angle. So it's definitely going to be different no matter what. Even if they're trying to, to, you know, do the same style of in terms of colors on their palette, and in terms of if they're trying to mimic a certain famous artist, still it's going to look different because everyone sees me from a different angle and everyone really does have their own style. So in just terms of how they draw or paint, they make marks on the page and there's a different texture and depending on the paper and the paint that they use. So it's kind of one of the most interesting things about modeling. But I would say that I began modeling and doing self-portraits because I think I felt kind of shy and insecure and yet I was longing to feel a sense of belonging and like like I am needed by other people or like I belong in a group and like I like to joke and say I'd like to join a group for loners you know the kind of group that I would feel comfortable in is a group for loners but I guess what I mean by that because if someone is really a loner maybe they wouldn't want to join any group at all so I guess what I mean by that is maybe I'm comfortable in groups where everyone's individuality is appreciated and acknowledged 
and where it's not really about conforming and everyone trying to be the same. It's about creative expression. And so I guess I feel comfortable since I am a creative artist. I feel comfortable when I model because I'm with a group of individuals who are all painting or drawing in their own unique way. And I feel like they appreciate me as the model that shows up that's different than all the other models that they draw and paint. I know at one of the art schools where I model, I think they have 50 different people on their modeling list. There's both men and women who model for art classes, and we're all different. We have different skin color, different ethnicities, different eyes, different kinds of eye sockets, totally different bone structure and skin color, different body types, different heights, different ages, different personalities, different kinds of poses we can do. Some people are really flexible. Some people are more stiff. It's just everyone is different. So each model has a unique chemistry with the art class. So I'll say that I started modeling, I mean, as a way to make a living as an artist, but also as a way to feel like I belonged in a group. So I, to this day, don't really feel very comfortable in a lot of group social situations. And yet I feel very comfortable being a model for medical students and for art students. And I love to do self portraits. And I'm thinking mostly with photography. I'm wondering, I actually am the moderator of a self portrait community on live journal. Although I've forgotten to update lately, I haven't updated in quite a while, actually, I should probably go do that. For years, somebody actually years ago made me the moderator of the self portrait live journal community. And there's lots of people that are members of that. And it's free to post photos of yourself there, or paintings or drawings, any kind of self portrait. So maybe I will explore this idea of self empowerment through self portraits and not as a way of being narcissistic or, or so caught up in ourselves. Like I've been accused of being too into myself and I'm thinking, why are people upset with me for being into myself? Maybe if they were more into themselves, then they would be inspired by me instead of feeling like it's some kind of competition or some kind of, hey, you're not supposed to do that. You know, why, why are people upset by that? If you're doing what you enjoy and what you love, that's the key. So if somebody really doesn't like self-portraits, I would say, well, don't do that. But if you enjoy it, hey, go for it. So that's a little bit of my take on self-portraiture and the idea that maybe I could collaborate with other people and start more of an official group uh, inviting men and women both. Somebody suggested that I do it for just women, but I think I want to include men as well and transgender people as well. Like anyone on the spectrum of male and female, any human, whether they think they're male, female, androgynous, non-binary, whatever, just humans that want to share self-portraits as a way of building self-esteem, creative self-expression, just having fun with your own identity and playing around with it. I'm fascinated by actors and how they explore different sides of themselves through the characters that they play and feel like they're becoming another character or exaggerating parts of themselves. And the next thing I wanted to talk about was recently, I am a huge Tom Petty fan, have been since I was 11 years old. And I recently, my boyfriend is in a rock and roll cover band, and he is a fan of Marty Stewart. Marty Stewart is a country rock, folk, bluegrass combination musician who is about 58 years old, and he has been playing music since he was 12 professionally. When he was, he played with Johnny Cash a long time ago. He was at one point married to one of Johnny Cash's daughters, I think named Cindy Cash. I don't know anything about her. I just recently saw Marty Stewart and his fabulous superlatives. I think that's the name of his band at the Triple Door in Seattle. It was an amazing show. I actually recorded something about it. And then I found a, a thing online. They covered a Tom Petty song, Running Down a Dream, Running Down a Dream. Never would it come to me, working on a mystery, going wherever it leads, running down a dream. So 
Yeah. So um, Brennan Down a Dream is a cool song and um, Marty Stewart and his fabulous superlatives covered it and it was really cool and they sang it in their own kind of voice was, which is a little bit more like Johnny Cash type standard voice um, as opposed to Tom Petty which you know who does the Bob dylan kind of Bob dylan and and just in one little part of the one little phrasing of running down a running down a dream they did it in the Tom Petty Bob dylan running down a dream style and I love that I love that kind of way of, of singing and I recently saw Marty Stewart live and it was just so good and the guitar was amazing and the mandolins and the guitars and each performer did their own solo and it's just you I guess you had to be there but it was really beautiful I know a lot of people don't like country music which is weird to me because I've always liked twangy music and I've always liked music that you know folk music storytelling emotional beautiful melodies and storytelling is involved in country music and folk music and rock and roll and that's one of the main reasons why I think I love the music of Tom Petty so much is that you can hear the influence of country blues rock and folk in Tom Petty he's definitely Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers are influenced by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Birds and Bob Dylan and even the Beach Boys and surf music and and Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and all the blues people and Miles Davis and a little bit of jazz thrown in there too sometimes. And so the whole idea of not liking a certain genre of music is, is foreign to me. I like a lot of different kinds of music. I guess I'm the least favorite fan of gos- gospel music doesn't thrill me in terms of really loud belted out singing. Although I love the heart and soul and the emotion that comes through gospel music. What I really love is that I heard the influence when I heard Marty Marty Stewart play. I realized, and then I found out that Mike Campbell, Tom Petty's guitar player from the Heartbreakers, produced, he produced the latest Marty Stewart album, which is called, I think, Way Out West or something. And it's just very interesting. And so I loved hearing all the different guitar. And my boyfriend is a guitarist. And so he knows, you know, oh, that's a Rickenbacker. Oh, that's a Gibson. Oh, that's an L5. Or that's a, you know, he's doing a, a, a tune up the D or a tune up the G. I don't really know all the guitar terms, but my boyfriend was telling me, oh, he's doing that. Oh, he's doing this. And it was just so fun to hear that. And I could hear the influence. I can hear the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, how much they're influenced by some of these country musicians and Johnny Cash. And they even worked with Johnny Cash and they even backed up Johnny Cash in one of his cool albums. So I forgot the name of that one, but it's a great album that Johnny Cash did soon before he passed away or maybe 2003 or something. So music, I've had some great musical experiences uh, recently. And thank you for listening. This is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring podcast number 32 in Seattle, Hollow Earth Radio. In cast the outcast In cast the outcast Decrease the corporation Increase cooperation In cast the outcast In cast the outcast Fragile sense of self Tangible desire For wealth Decrease the corporation Increase cooperation In cast the outcast Outcast the in cast, in cast the outcast, outcast the in cast, decrease the corporation.
cooperation, increase cooperation, fragile sense of self, tangible desire for wealth, authentic ejaculation of my soul, molten orange, liquid glow, anger takes its toll, in cast the outcast, outcast the in cast, decrease the corporation, increase cooperation, in cast the outcast, outcast the in cast, fragile sense of self, tangible desire for wealth, in cast the outcast, outcast the in cast, decrease the corporation, increase cooperation, iconoclast landed here, iconoclast landed here, in cast the outcast, outcast the in cast, decrease the corporation, increase cooperation, Unwrap the mummy. <laughs> Unwrap the mummy running. Clap away the trap. A cano class landed here. In cast the outcast. Outcast the in cast. Blasting puritanical canister, common ground, astounded in the round, center well, do tell, out of shell, unguarded, no longer martyred. Vexing, letting ampersands free to a degree, free to be you and me. Uncover what's within, releasing chemical. Hardwired competition. Decrease the corporation. Increase cooperation. In cast the outcast. Outcast the in cast. Intuition coming to fruition. Thrive on dead lines, alive in headlines. Thrive on dead lines, alive in headlines. Unwrap the mummy running. Unwrap 
the mummy running clap away the trap iconoclast landed here in cast the outcast outcast the in cast decrease the corporation increase cooperation authentic ejaculation of my soul molten orange liquid glow anger takes its toll fragile sense of self tangible desire for wealth decrease the corporation increase cooperation in cast the outcast outcast the in cast thrive on deadlines alive in headlines thrive on dead lines alive in headlines in cast the outcast outcast the in cast decrease the corporation increase cooperation in cast the outcast outcast the in cast unwrap the mummy unwrap the mummy clap away the trap iconoclast landed here iconoclast landed here in cast the outcast outcast the in cast blasting puritanical canister authentic ejaculation of our soul molten orange liquid glow anger takes its toll in cast the outcast outcast the in cast thrive on dead lines alive in head lines thrive on dead lines alive in head lines in cast the outcast outcast the in cast That was In Cast the Outcast by Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, and Astro Blue was doing the guitar on that. We did that a few years ago, my friend and I, and I wanted to say that this is Hollow Earth Radio Seattle. You're listening to podcast number 32, Goddess Kring. So my name is Shannon Nicole Kringen, and I feel depressed. Oh my God, I thought I was in a better mood. Recently, my boyfriend's father passed away suddenly. He was in his upper 80s. I only met him once. Long story. But it's very sad. And uh, so my boyfriend um, is visiting his mother. And they're very private people. So I won't say anything else other than that. Let's just say that I feel sad for them. And I have empathy and compassion but I feel kind of nervous about the whole thing. And it occurred to me that I've been dating this man for almost three years, two and a half years, which is amazing. 
my love life has been very difficult and I don't know if it's because I choose the wrong people or just because of whatever problems that I have but this person that I've been with for two and a half years he's a a really good guy and there's a pretty stable thing happening with he and I uh, but I don't think we're compatible enough to live together but then I'm thinking I don't think I want to live with anyone I've only lived with two boyfriends and it was a disaster overall in terms of I just didn't feel like it was the right thing for me but I'm trying to just be here now it's 2017 and I've had many different relationships in my lifetime and I'm glad that I keep trying but it occurs to me that I feel single like not single in terms of I'm looking for a guy but single in terms of I feel really like I want to be independent and autonomous and like I don't want to give my power away to any guy or any boyfriend I'd also don't want to give my power away to any female any any uh, women in my life who, who want to boss me around my grandmother was a little bit domineering and my mom and I have certain issues that I won't get into because she's a very private person but I do feel competitive with other women which I think is very sad I wish that I had like the whole sisterly love thing Tori Amos talks about how women can sometimes betray each other and upset each other and, you know, be judgmental and competitive with each other, which is true. And I've had some women that I've had uh, friendships with, but it just didn't really work out too well for various reasons. And I'm thinking I'm pretty much a loner. Maybe it doesn't matter if I'm a loner because I'm wounded or am I a loner because of I was just born that way. So like the Lady Gaga song, I was born this way. So whatever, I don't know what the words are to Lady Gaga. I, I actually really like Lady Gaga. I don't really listen to her music, but I, when I see the videos, I smile. And I think she's very, very talented and a uh, singer, songwriter, performer, and has a good heart and soul and is very smart. So let's just say, but the music is not my favorite. I love, as we know, Tom Petty widens my jetty. I love Tom Petty and Tori Amos and Neil Young. Edie Brickell is a female singer that I love. Let's see. Heather Nova, Tori Amos, Joni Mitchell, Lucinda Williams, uh, Jessie Sykes, a local lady around here in Seattle. She's great. I'm just trying to think of more women singers that I like. I like bits and pieces of Jewel. I especially like Jewel when she's very folk when she sings more folk style, I saw her live. I volunteered actually for concerts at the Zoo Tunes and Jewel was there twice. Joan Baez, I love Joan Baez. So Joni Mitchell, Joan Baez, Edie Brickell, I love Katie Lang, I love Lucinda Williams. So there's different female, Edie Brickell especially, I, I love her voice. I like people who, who bend their voices up and down and experiment. I love Tom Petty, Neil Young, Bob Dylan, Lou Reed, Roy Orbison, Chris Isaac, recently discovered Marty Stewart, really enjoy him and his, his fabulous superlative band, Marty Stewart and the Fabulous Superlatives. I talked about that earlier in the show. I got to see Marty Stewart for the first time live with my boyfriend at the Triple Door here in Seattle. That was an amazing show. I absolutely love the mandolin and the guitar playing that they did. Um, his band has four people in it. And what is the guy's name? Kenny Vaughn is an amazing guitar player. And forgive me, I forgot the names of the drummer and the bass player in his band, but they're all very, very talented musicians. And it, it occurs to me that I like uh, really good country music like Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash and some Hank Williams and some Marty Stewart and some other country uh, performers I don't know the names of, but I just know it when I hear it, if it's high quality. If it's, you know, good music is, is timeless and it's genreless. It's beyond the genre. You know, when people say, oh, I don't like country music, or I don't like rock, or I don't like jazz, or I don't like the blues, I feel sad about that because music is such a full spectrum. But then again, it's everybody's right to like or not like whatever they like or they don't like. I, I love people who bend their voices. And I, th I was going to say, I think I really like country music the way that 
the slide guitars and the twangy, the twangy sounding instruments go up and down and in and out and they kind of undulate. And it occurs to me that I like singers who do the same thing. I think of Tom Petty and Bob Dylan and Tori Amos and Neil Young and all of these interesting people who sing that I like them. And also Katie Lang and Roy Orbison also do it where they bend their voices up and down. And, you know, instead of just singing a word, I guess Johnny Cash didn't really do that. Johnny Cash, though, had such a great, unique voice. I also love Eddie Vedder's voice. They have such beautiful voices. There's a, an earthy, warm quality to Edie Brickell and Eddie Vedder's voice. And Chris Cornell also had a beautiful voice. May he rest in peace. Um, let's just say that some of my favorite singers like Edie Brickell, Tori Amos, Mick Jagger, Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, they bend their voices up and down. I think Neil Young does that too sort of bend their voices up and down and I guess Alanis Morissette does a lot of that it's it's like you you bend your voice is that even the right word I like vocalists who sing in a way that's unique and they play with the texture and the sound of their voice and when I hear music I see shapes dance in my head so I love art and music and theater and dance I love movies. I'm right now watching Collateral Beauty about grief and loss and about knowing that there's always beauty even when there's great grief and sadness. I'm feeling sad right now, sad about myself. I think that I'm probably going to want to live alone for the rest of my life. I'm an only child, so maybe I was just born with that kind of style. I don't know if my soul incarnated into this lifetime wanting to just be alone and get away from other people or am I wounded in certain ways from being, you know, bullied as a kid and, and my parents were distracted and they had a certain critical perfectionistic way of thinking about things and they sort of encouraged me and they were sort of critical in their own subtle way. Mostly they criticized successful people. I grew up thinking that being successful would be kind of shameful. At least that's the, the logic that I made of that as a child. I'm sure that my parents did not want me to grow up fearing success. Oh, let's raise a daughter that fears success and failure. Yeah, that's our goal. No, I know that wasn't their goal. But as a little kid, I decided that's what it meant. I decided that it meant being successful would mean that you're an egomaniac, that you're a narcissist, that you're on a power trip, that you're underrated or overrated. I guess if you're successful, you're overrated. And if you're not successful, you're underrated. If you're talented, if you're good looking and talented, <laughs> that's kind of what my, my dad actually taught me that a little bit, but he also taught me a lot of good things. But I'm just, I'm just noticing my sadness and my grief around some of these things. And my mom if my mom and I have certain issues that I just don't even want to get into because it's just too sad. And my grandmother, rest in peace, Grandma Jody. She's she's not, not no longer on this planet. You know, I never saw the body. My boyfriend said that he didn't feel the need to see his dad's body. You know, I said, God, if I were you, I'd want to see the body of the person to say goodbye to them and just know the reality that they're really not here anymore. My stepfather died suddenly about two and a half years ago, and I never saw his body. My mom actually saw him die at home. The paramedics tried to revive him. He did not want to be revived, but she didn't have the piece of paper. So she had to let the paramedics try to save him, but his heart would not restart. And he was kind of ill, and he, he wasn't wanting to stick around if his body wasn't able to function properly and if he had to be hooked up to a machine he did not want to be here so my stepfather was a very spiritual person and was ready to drop his body I guess so I never saw his body though my mom saw that his skin color changed and she just knew that he just wasn't there you know it's like oh okay he's gone he's not there anymore his soul his brain and his heart stopped functioning and his soul was just gone it just left his body and so she looked at him and she just knew he's gone. Let him go. 
And of course, she was very sad and went and is still going through a grief process because they were together for 30 years. That was her fourth husband. And they were together for 30 years and they had a pretty amazing relationship. You know, they really clicked with, they were both artists and spiritual Eastern philosophy type, spiritual seeker type people into the philosophy and the wisdom of Ramana Maharshi, Krishnamurti, non-duality, Advaita Vedanta. So they were really into that and certain kinds of artwork that they both did and they also appreciated a lot of other artists. So they had a good relationship, but I never saw the body of my stepfather and so it's like it would have kind of helped me to say goodbye, but it was really none of my business. It was my mom's husband, so oh well. So I never saw his body and I never saw the body of my grandma when she died. My grandmother was on her deathbed at my uncle's house for the last couple years of her life. She had this disease where she lost touch with her um I forgot what it was called but she died very slowly and I never said goodbye well I knew that the last time I saw her might have been the last time that I saw her and indeed it was and she passed away and I never saw her body so it's it's like everybody in my family when they die they just get cremated and there's usually not even a funeral so there's no funeral and people just get cremated so because it's just too expensive to have a funeral and I guess nobody really cares about having a formal traditional you know funeral type thing so I never say goodbye um, and I guess my boyfriend doesn't want to see his dad's body either so I guess to each their own but when when someone close to me passes away I want to see their body you know when my cat Tux died well, I was with them because I had to have him euthanized because he was really ill and in a lot of pain. And I saw that he was just not there anymore. I looked into his eyes when he was dead and he just wasn't there. And my cat Stella died on my bed. She was very ill and I was sort of giving her the kitty version of kitty morphine kind of that the vet gave me to help her. Um, oh, Kisun. And now I have my kitty Kisun. And when he dies, hey, when he dies, well, hopefully he'll last a lot longer. I think he's about nine years old. I will say goodbye to him. So when my mother and or father dies or passes away, I want to see their body so that I can know the reality of the fact that they're no longer alive. So I guess I'm just being a little morbid right now. Sorry if this upsets anyone. I just want to acknowledge the reality that Eventually, we all pass away from this planet Earth and we go somewhere else. And I don't really know if consciousness continues or not. I have a hunch that it does, but I think it's different than what we think. But I'm not really a religious person, but I'm not really an atheist either. I'm kind of a little bit agnostic. I don't believe in God in terms of religious, you know, man in the sky that judges us or a woman in the sky. I don't think God is a man or a woman. I think that God is beyond, you know, it's androgynous. It's, it's, it's the energy of the universe. It's the yin and the yang. It's the, the whole universe that creates itself is what God is to me. So I believe in energy that creates the universe. So I feel sad. I feel like you know, I have like a special deal on my rent because I have a special voucher that entitles me to have my rent only be a third of my income, which is amazing. I was on a waiting list for a few years and I, my name was drawn and I just feel so fortunate that my rent is reasonable and I like being independent. And quite honestly, I'm afraid if I move in with a man, you know, it won't work out and then I'll have to move and then I'll, I'll lose my low income rent. So basically, I'm probably going to live by myself forever <laughs> for the rest of my life. I'm only 48 now, so I might have many, 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 many years to go. And I work constantly. You know, I don't really have much of a personal life. I have a boyfriend that I'm dating I don't really have too many friends. I have creative writing group that I meet with. People try to be friends with me, but I mostly avoid it. So I, I'm just a real workhorse. I love to just model and work with medical students and art students. And I hope that I have more time to do my artwork if I would just take time. I just recently got myself some colored pencils and some colored markers. And I want to get my tablet out and draw. Oh, wow, we're almost out of time. So this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, podcast number 32. Go to shannonkringen.com to see my different uh, visual art, my photography and music and poetry and 
Feel free to write me with questions or comments, and I'll see you next week. And this has been, hopefully, an interesting experience for you. Thank you for listening. I'll work on the next one now. And Goddess Kring Radio. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring.